Welcome to the Cato Institute. I'm Ian Vasquez. I direct our Center for Global Liberty and uh, Prosperity. It's been four and a half years since the Rose Revolution initiated uh, transformation of the politics and economics of Georgia. And although Georgia is a relatively late uh, reformer, it's also become one of the, the post-socialist world's more successful uh, reformer. Georgia has opened its economy to trade and investment, which has more than quadrupled in the last four years. It's reduced the size of its government bureaucracy, privatized state enterprises, and begun civil service uh, reform. It implemented a 12 percent flat income tax, 1 percent lower than Russia's. It has been a pioneer in the reduction of bureaucratic regulations that make it difficult to start and uh, maintain uh, a business, and on and on. The results have been impressive. Uh, growth has been not, over 9% uh, per year on an annual uh, average. Most international economic and political indicators show impressive progress. Uh, Georgia now ranks 44 out of 141 countries in the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom of the World report. Freedom House's ranking of political and civil uh, freedoms also shows uh, measurable progress in Georgia. The World Bank's Doing Business report cites uh, Georgia as one of the world's leading reformers. And Transparency International also shows that Georgia has uh, reduced uh, the level of corruption in the country. All of this has been done in a challenging domestic and uh, international environment. Russia's aggressive attitude towards Georgia, for example, has resulted in an embargo on the country. And yet, Georgia has somehow managed to continue to reform and to continue to grow. Last year's growth rate in Georgia was about 12.5 percent. Progress in Georgia, a difficult part of the world, uh, is a testament to the power of the right ideas and the right policies and what uh, they can ac accomplish in transforming uh, politics and society. It is also a testament of the role that uh, individuals play and the role the, that uh, leadership uh, plays in making the difference. I'm very pleased, uh, therefore, to have uh, one of those key individuals, Kaha Bendukidze, uh, perhaps the driving force behind jo Georgia's uh, reforms with us today. Kaha is a remarkable person. He began his uh, career in Russia as a biologist, a very successful one. Uh, when I met him uh, five years ago, he was a very well-known and successful uh, businessman in Russia, heading OMZ. In 2004, he left uh, Russia uh, and his business behind to help uh, contribute to uh, progress in his own country, Georgia, where he became the Minister of Economics. He has since been uh, the State Minister for Reform Coordination and is now the head of the State Chancellery in uh, Georgia. Uh, as you can hear, uh, Kaha is a, a very versatile person, and I'm pleased to welcome him to, to, so that we can all hear uh, about what has been accomplished and also the challenges uh, that remain in the remaining agenda. Please help me welcome our very good friend, Kaha Bendukidze. Thank you. Uh, and uh, um, first of all, I want to mention that I am not biting people, so from last rows, you can welcome to sit here. Um, uh, so uh, let me be quite short, and I'll prefer to have more questions than, than answer on that question. So the. Uh, there was a lot of reforms. Any country coming from the uh, Soviet bloc needs a lot of reforms. And uh, sometimes it's impossible to imagine how, how, how deep reforms you need. So uh, I'm most focused here on uh, economic reforms, but uh, I want to say that there was some other reforms I can just mention later, like education and others. And the, uh, uh, the uh, ideology of our reforms was uh, going through uh, uh, making uh, m everything private as much as possible, uh, having small government as much as possible, deregulating, that means, and uh, uh, that was the, I think, that uh, some uh, 
uh, innovation uh, that we decide to uh, liberalize our market, uh, open our society unilaterally, which in some time is not, is not an idea about that. Uh, what means unilateral liberalization? It means that we are not waiting other countries when they decide to reduce, for example, custom duties. Uh, if they want to torture their, their, their citizens, it's their business. Uh, uh, we, we, if, if they, uh, unfortunately for us, want to uh, have uh, very sophisticated visa regimes for our citizens, it's uh, our problem, but we cannot pay to their citizens the same. So, and uh, so that's the way how we do a lot of things. For example, uh, we uh, make uh, uh, for more than 50 nations, no, no, there is no visa requirements in Georgia. For example, if you are American, if you are Ukrainian, if you are Uzbek, if you are uh, Swiss, if you are Canadian or South Korean, you can come and you don't require any visa. Uh, the, the, the Georgian citizens in those countries, require, uh, most of those countries require a visa. But um, I mean, we, we cannot pay, I mean, symmetrically. And uh, it has uh, very uh, good result on, uh, for example, on tourist uh, inflow, uh, not only tourists, but on, on tourists also. So it was, I, I think it's one of the, um, the people said it's fastest growing destination, maybe. Or we have no quotas on, uh, we, uh, uh, we have no quotas on import or export. We uh, significantly simplify our uh, custom duty system, custom tariff system, having 16 different uh, bands or rates and uh, the going up to 35% of some, some, some of the items. We have now three rates, zero, five, and 12. And uh, we are using 0% rate for 90% of goods. And we have 12 and 5 percent rates. It was some result of political compromise. No, no rationals behind, of course, uh, on some agricultural products and uh, construction materials. And the effective rate, based on custom statistics, is 0.62 percent. It is uh, one of the lowest uh, uh, average rates uh, globally. Uh, uh, the uh, among uh, uh, leaders are Singapore, Hong Kong, Macau, and uh, Georgia. But, uh, for example, Singapore, they reduce their import, uh, import duties. Uh, by under the WTO agreement, you have two types of import duties, uh, so-called actual and bounded. Bounded means that if you reduce bounded duties, you cannot then increase them. It's impossible. It's, you notify WTO secretariat, and that's an uh, irreversible thing. So Singapore reduced actual duties, but they have quite high 7%, something like that, bounded duties. So it means that they can increase in some circumstances. We reduce bounded duties, so it's irreversible. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, kept by WTO agreement. Uh, and uh, the customs tariff, which is collected by uh, customs service, is 0.3% uh, of GDP, so, so that means that it is there is no any any real obstacle for <coughs> for uh, for import, and our our, our market is really open. Uh, another another uh, another uh, barrier to uh, entry market entry is technical requirements, uh, and the different countries are trying to develop their own technical requirements. Uh, sometimes those technical requirements are. Uh, let's say forbidding uh, any any good to go to that market, so we decide not to. We ha we cannot now pay hundreds of millions of dollars and the five here to develop some Georgian technical requirements. We don't want to join any developed country technical requirements because that means that we'll kill uh, our industry, we'll kill significant part of import which is coming from other countries. So we decide just to equalize. Uh, developed country technical requirements and our neighboring country technical requirements to our national technical requirements. So they all are legally, they can be legally accepted, uh, legally used in Georgia. And they, there is national treatment for all those type technical requirements. And it is more than 40 nations, actually. 
So what was the, uh, also we tried to uh, reduce paperwork and administration of export and import. So you can see the uh, amount of days, uh, average days required for export and for import. It was huge and now we reduce it quite significantly, but we want to reduce it even more. And the uh, outcome, outcome not only from this, those measures, but from others also, is that we international trade increased during the last four years more than 300 percent. And uh, Georgia uh, is now uh, not only importing uh, for Georgians' needs and but sometimes uh, there is quite significant amount of goods imported into Georgia for, uh, and then re-exported to neighboring countries. So the, uh, the one of the biggest obstacles was the uh, tax, uh, tax code, tax regulation. We have a huge amount of taxes. You can see here we have uh, 22 taxes, yeah? Uh, now we have six taxes, personal income, corporate income or corporate profit, VAT, property, customs uh, tax, which I mentioned before, and excise tax. For example, the average wage taxation based on two taxes, it was uh, income tax, which was progressive, and uh, uh, social tax, which actually means that in countries where there's no big capital incomes, you are taxing income by these two taxes, actually, and it happens in all countries. And when you see that there is some countries which has very low income tax, you should ask what's their social tax or wage tax, and at the end of the day, you'll, you'll find that it's uh, quite high. For example, Russia has 13% personal income tax, but uh, the, uh, uh, the, there is additional, uh, uh, what's called uh, unified social tax, which is uh, regressive, but for low income, uh, low income workers, it's taxing more than 30% of their income. So we reduce this tax, the wage taxation, which was around 40 due to progressive nature, some different, to 27% in 2005, and to 25% now, and we are planning to have 24% next year, and uh, go to 15% personal income tax, which would be the only tax applied to wages or incomes uh, to year 2014. So uh, we make tax amnesty for any tax evasion uh, be done before year 2004, and it helps to clean huge amount of, huge amount of uh, bad legacy. Also, we uh, make some new amendments. Uh, the, the, there is no income tax for capital market incomes, uh, and no, uh, in, no income tax for overseas uh, uh, personal incomes, which I think is very important for Americans, where, because Americans are taxed for any foreign income. And uh, the factual tax revenues, which are adjusted to inflation, so it means in real terms, increased 80 percent uh, between year 2005 to year 2007, and I think that we'll have more increase this year a little bit. So that's the same as a chart. So um, the licensing, uh, actually, there is an idea somewhere born I don't know in Germany or where that. Uh, the uh, normal person cannot conduct activity without having special license. And uh, there was huge amount of licenses. Um, uh, and that's uh, unfortunately usual for many countries. And uh, we make, uh, we reduce the number of licenses uh, 85%, so we have now six times less licenses than we have, license permits we have before. And we simplify the licensing. And I think that we can uh, this year make another, uh, another, sh another uh, movement, another um, uh, big leap, uh, and reduce maybe twice or three times. Uh, and it was uh, uh, 
uh, one-stop shop licensing and uh, uh, silencing constant rule, which means that if you apply for license and you get no answers, that means that you are approved. Uh, for example, what it means for uh, construction permits uh, that uh, we reduce a number of uh, number of steps from 29 to 17, and from May there is effective regulation which is reducing in uh, two steps less, so it will be 15 steps. So it means that day, days for putting new commercial construction into use is two, two times less, and the uh, building uh, uh, permit regulation is uh, uh, not the best uh, globally, but uh, close to what the Hong there is in Hong Kong. Uh, and we, we hope that we can make it, it uh, easier. There is one thing which, uh, I mean, it's here because it's about licensing, but it's about other things. It's about natural resources. Mm -hmm. uh, the continental approach to natural resources, continental European approach, is that natural resources belongs to country and you just <coughs> can be licensed to use those resources, uh, which uh, the, that's the idea which I don't like. But uh, there is two different approaches to either in the framework of this. Uh, one is to have this as a, a personal uh, gift, personal grant that you are granted to, uh, to for example, uh, for fishery or you are granted to for uh, logging here. And another is the, the, the which, which, which we uh, implement the idea of tradable licenses, tradable and dividable licenses, and uh, which are auctioned. And uh, so it means that they are more like to uh, property rights, real property rights, than uh, these uh, continental style licenses. And uh, of course, uh, I, I think that the property rights and uh, the pro property procedures are very important for any country and for developing country much more. So we simplify property uh, re registration procedures, and now it takes two days to register property, to change ownership, to change title. Uh, the uh, very big leap was uh, the uh, business registration changes. We have you should go to court and be registered as a uh, legal person, then go to uh, tax department and be registered as taxpayer. It takes um, 30 days of good result. Really, in reality, it takes maybe two months. So we have three improvements, three steps, and uh, from uh, May 10th, now we have a procedure which is taking one day for business registration. It means that uh, actually it's taking uh, half an hour, but I mean, if measuring days, you're going to tax office, making a standard application and um, getting your tax payers number and that's all. And we are registering uh, up to 5,000 new businesses a month. Uh, 5,000 new business, 60,000 a, a year. Uh, 60,000 a business a year is uh, quite a big for 4 million, uh, 4 million citizen country, four and a half. And also we reduce, first we reduce the uh, requirements of paid in capital and then we abolish it. So now it's extremely easy. So one of the uh, most controversial part of our reforms was uh, labor reform. Why controversial? And maybe it's very difficult to explain in the United States uh, because uh, the United States has no labor code on the, that classic understanding, no bunch of rules dictating how we can hire someone or fire someone on how, how I can be hired or fired. And that's the difference between uh, practically all other countries, uh, especially in Europe, where uh, the contractual agreements between employer and employee is uh, uh, practically not allowed. Yeah. And uh, uh, why, it is <coughs> why it was very con uh, con uh, really controversial, not because of the result of why, why, how it was done, because there is now huge pressure from uh, European trade unions to uh, reverse the situation. International Labour Organization is pressing uh, European Union to withdraw, withdraw uh, 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 
GSP plus uh, system, which is which means uh, import duty preferences for Georgia, which were rewarded two years ago. Uh, and the condition is that we, if, if we want to maintain this, those those uh, preferences, we, sh we should uh, we should abolish our uh, existing labor code. And so that means that uh, sometimes not only uh, political processes within the country are changing the uh, regulations, but we hope we will not change here, but also also uh, some international organizations can be very active on, uh, on changing uh, institutional situation within the country. Uh, the financial reform, which was uh, done, uh, this uh, part of was, part of it was done in 2007. Part was done this year, actually two months ago. That we have mandatory fiscal surplus now within our law, and this surplus uh, will be accumulated in the Future Generation Fund and Stable Development Fund. Uh, Central bank is responsible for inflation. He is not responsible for. A, a, a currency rate or, for example, an economic growth or um, um, employment or something like that. He can do that if it is not harming price stability. So price stability is the main goal of central bank. Uh, to improve the institutional quality of central bank, uh, the law allows foreigners to be members of central bank board. Uh, and uh, there is an inflation threshold which um, uh, about which Parliament must conduct vote of confidence on uh, Central Bank President, which means that Central Bank President is personally responsible for high inflation. And uh, we remove all uh, bank supervising things uh, uh, from Central Bank, and there is separate uh, affiliated, uh, let's say, sister agency, financial supervisory agency, which is overseeing whole financial sector. Also, we uh, we make uh, quite a lot of small uh, changes, like uh, international financial, financial companies uh, can be established in Georgia, and they will be uh, uh, they'll enjoy zero profit tax from any overseas activities. We demutualize, we allow demutualization of our stock exchange and the competition among stock exchanges, and many other things. We deregulate uh, uh, intra intercorporate relationships because uh, we are moving from uh, German style German style uh, corporate act uh, or, uh, to uh, I mean uh, normal uh, normal and uh, many many other things for example uh, any any uh, for any international reputable uh, financial institution can work in Georgia without special permit or license. Uh, they don't need to prove that they are good. They just need to show that they are registered in a uh, uh, transparent country. And uh, for banks, there is additional requirement. They should have uh, a good, good credit rating. And that's all. They can, they can work in Georgia. So um, privatization, why privatization is important for developing countries? First of all, there is no culture of uh, well, uh, managing state-owned enterprises. I think there is no culture of managing state-owned enterprises anywhere, but in developing countries, it's a nightmare. Second, it's always a place of different types of corruption, politically vested interests, and others. So it was my first and personal uh, personal goal to privatize as much as possible because I think that the countries like Georgia, corruption is one of the biggest uh, potential problems. So what 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 was done? What is ongoing? So we privatize all international airports, and uh, uh, we are looking to uh, privatize maybe through IPO in a few years the railway. We privatize all seaports. Mm, uh, we prioritize generation, generating distribution uh, 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 of electricity. Uh, we prioritize natural gas distribution companies. We uh, prioritize, we allow to prioritize agricultural land, and it's just a process which people are applying. It will happen quite soon. And uh, 
as I mentioned, we, uh, we have this quasi-privatization of natural resources through tradable licenses. We, we are a small country on the crossroad of different countries, and it's very important for us to have, to have a good transport system, and for that, we open our transport system, uh, abolish uh, uh, restrictive transit fees, uh, quotas, uh, uh, permits, we liberalize railway tariff policy. It means that railway is just a company. They are selling their services, and they are deciding what's the price of those services. And uh, we are big, big admirers of open sky policy. Unfortunately, many other countries are not. So, but uh, we, 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 we have no restrictions on numbers of passengers, destinations, frequency of flights, and other things. Uh, so in 2004, when I, come, when I returned to Georgia, and it was practically sharply four years ago, it was in May 2004, um, uh, in a capital city we have blackouts um, in some parts of the city each day, in some parts uh, twice a week, three times a week. In a rural area there was actually uh, can say that we have blackouts. We have permanent blackout, and sometimes there was electricity. And the system was uh, not working. Uh, it was heavily subsidized. Uh, and it was, it was, uh, and it was uh, 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 its formal structure. Formal structure of this of electricity sector was uh, like in uh, United Kingdom. Uh, so uh, uh, it was vertical. There was vertical separation, uh, uh, a blind market like pool in United, uh, United Kingdom, everything like that. But it was not working. So because it was system based on uh, forbidding people uh, making deals, and no system can be good, especially in a country like Georgia. So uh, also there was at that moment there was big political. Uh, an, an, an acceptance to privatize this system immediately. So we uh, decide to change regulation, invest money, government money in the system, and then privatize. So we allow long-term contracts between producers and consumers of electricity. We deregulate completely new capacity. So if you build new uh, power system in Georgia, you, you have you are producing what you have, what you want. The tariff is yours, and nobody is looking what, how, for how much you are selling, and we allow vertical integration. Uh, we do the same, ref the, like, like same reform in the uh, gas sector um, uh, last year and this year. We deregulate uh, wholesale uh, prices, and uh, we deregulate new gas networks completely. So, uh, because um, and that's, I think, one of the most important things uh, have been done. There was many other reforms. I, I, I tell you that I'll, 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 I'll uh, talk about that. They are not directly economic, but of course there is no um, compartment like this economy. That's not economy. It's all intertwined. So uh, uh, the, what was done? It was done. Uh, petrol police uh, or police reform. We have a huge corrupted police machinery. Uh, inefficient, uh, uh, low quality, bribe taking. Uh, we have a, a, a road police which was doing nothing except taking bribes. So uh, in one day, all these policemen were fired. During three weeks or something like that, there was no policeman in Georgia. Nothing happens because that's the nature of reforms on countries like Georgia or some others that when you are demolishing these dysfunctional institutions, people say, oh, what will happen? Nothing can happen because it's a dysfunctional institution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I switch off light in the room where there is no light, nothing happens. There is no light before, there will be no light after. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, create new police forces based on uh, this patrol, patrol uh, patrolling uh, regions, uh, a concept, uh, completely new people, uh, 87 or something like that are new. 
um, raise salaries, give normal equipment, uh, and uh, now today they have one of the highest uh, uh, public approval uh, among state agencies. Uh, military reform, uh, reform which is about uh, eco economics, uh, it's anti-monopoly reform, we can call it, I don't know how, antitrust reform, it means that we are not looking to companies buying each other and having that or this market share. And we are only looking uh, uh, government not to help them to build artificially through government legal or illegal activity or government officials activity, the uh, controlling position. So the ongoing reforms, or some of them done, uh, from the bottom, the education, we have 100% school choice system, so uh, all uh, uh, that's publicly funded uh, the school choice system. When we are providing money to student and student is making a decision uh, where to go or his parents when he's small, so uh, this is both for uh, high, uh, for uh, schools, high schools, and for for uh, universities. And uh, uh, the same type of reforms when we are funding, not an not a institution, but we are funding a, 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 a citizen is for uh, uh, health care reform, which uh, there is two big parts. One is financing reform, which means that uh, going from very strange uh, quasi-European style uh, system to a system when we are covering through health insurance in private companies, the most needless or needed population. And uh, another is that uh, we have a plan to restructure our hospital sector, uh, not to have practically any state-owned and state-run hospital, <coughs> to reduce number of beds and to have all, all of them privately owned and competing with each other. So, the results, some, some of the results are good, some of the results I, I am very happy. For example, the export is growing at a very high rate. Uh, investments are different types of investments, I mean, the foreign direct portfolio, etc. They are growing with a very high rate. GDP is growing in both uh, terms. And there was also many other reforms which are quoted here. Uh, this is not just not to show you what, but just to show how many, of course. And of course, we have many other things to be done, and there is only some, some of them, uh, like uh, forest and uh, natural resources go to real ownership, uh, more deep school reform, having now only 7% of Georgian uh, students, I mean high and, and below uh, 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 school students, they are going to, uh, to uh, private schools. Uh, we want to have in nearest years at least 25% going to private schools. Um, complete having zero import duties, uh, currency reform, and uh, the pension reform, which is, I think, uh, the, one of the most important things. So, thank you. And at the end, of, I want to say, of course, it's not everything not so rosy. Of course, we have uh, political bets. We have uh, we have public unrest uh, November. We have new presidential elections. In uh, so, president step down, and we have new elections, and the same president win in the uh, beginning of uh, of uh, uh, January. We have we have uh, new parliamentary elections uh, uh, next Wednesday, uh, but we are going forward. For example, we make the last big financial reforms between presidential election and the upcoming parliamentary election. It was not an easy thing, but uh, it was done, and uh, I think that we have a chance to uh, to be. Uh, to be uh, uh, proud of the result in one hand, um, 
Uh, and another is that uh, to, to continue these things, because only if we continue these things, we can achieve really high rate of growth and really can achieve what all we want. We, uh, we want to uh, see Georgia as a country which is among developed nations, not developing nations for 70 years. Yeah? We can be developing nation maybe 20 years, but we want in 30 years to be a developed nation. So that's, uh, that's what we want. That's why we are working. Once more, thank you. Thanks very much, Kaha. It really is impressive, the number of reforms and the quality of the reforms that have been done in such a short period of time in Georgia. I don't think I can, th I can think of any uh, reforming country that has done so much in su such a, a short period of time. I should also mention that uh, Kaha is not just an advocate of, of uh, more and greater freedoms in, in Georgia, but he has uh, long been an advocate of of individual liberty in the region around uh, the world. And the same can be said of our colleague Andrei Ilarionov, who's a senior fellow here at the Cato Institute. Before coming to the Cato Institute, he was the uh, uh, chief economic advisor of President uh, Putin and has long been involved in promoting uh, reforms in Russia. He was a member of the f initial uh, reform team after the fall of, the, of uh, communism there, and has uh, importantly, been a student of economic reforms and of transition uh, economies, and uh, I, I think one of the most sophisticated observers of the challenges of moving from state uh, uh, socialism to a free market and a free society, and he will have some comments about that regarding Georgia. Please help me welcome Andre. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will start from uh, with, with my personal note um, of uh, the event that happened almost exactly four years ago, in late May year 2004, when I was sitting in the office in Kremlin where both Yen and Kaha have been, and I got a call from Kaha saying that, uh, that Kaha did talk to the Georgian president and is going to accept his invitation to move from Russia to Georgia to be a minister on uh, economic reform, in charge of economic reform. I probably would not have in our words to explain what kind of shock I got with that call. Probably this was a really gravest shock uh, during my uh, almost six uh, year, 10 year uh, as a, uh, economic advisor to the Russian president. Because probably uh, not everybody knows, uh, still remembers that uh, Kaha spent um, some probably maybe a couple of decades of his adult life, almost all his adult life, not in Georgia, but in Moscow. He's a biologist by training. And in late 80s, he studied uh, his business, first of all, in uh, some kind of uh, biological stuff, and after that moved to some areas, and happened to be a very, very successful business person in Russia. As a very successful business person, he uh, joined the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs and became very visible and very vocal uh, person, not only in the Union, but in the whole country. Uh, we are talking right now about the achievements that he, with his colleagues, uh, have uh, made in Georgia. But before that, uh, Kaha did participate very actively in economic reform process and e economic reform public debate in Russia. Uh, such reforms like deregulation, uh, tax reduction, and especially law on the central bank and currency reform in Russia, all of these have happened, uh, could not happen without incredible support and contribution uh, from Kaha. And I would like to say that the current state of convertibility of the Russian ruble is a really the clear result and the clear some kind of contribution of anyone more than Kaha bin Dukidze in Russia, not in Georgia. And what has been achieved and what is, can be, uh, what is praised to be success of the Russian authorities, including the current Russian authorities, it actually has been done by somebody else. So that is why, uh, and just, uh, it's not only the contribution in the reform process, but also how powerful uh, was his voice 
with a uh, very special and very uh, touching uh, sense of humor, both Russian and Georgian, and a mixture of both uh, this humor for Russia, and how important and how attractive uh, uh, it was in Russia for uh, some kind of uh, 15 years uh, from 1992 to uh, uh, some kind of uh, year 2004. That is why when I got this call, I said, okay, that's, that's a great loss for Russia. And as probably some of you uh, notice, Russia is not a very small country in terms of population. Uh, it's 142 million uh, people almost. Uh, and it just looks like, what can uh, do one person? But it looks like it's a lot. And since uh, Kaha departed to Georgia, it became so visible and so some kind of, you, you can feel it, how empty became the Russian public policy and Russian public debate without uh, such an important and intelligent and sophisticated and deep um, uh, thinker and participant in our debate. And since Kaha moved to Georgia, now it's four years, uh, almost four years, uh, as Kaha is participating in these reforms. So he produces a very, very short, a very brief list of something that has been achieved there. And certainly much more has been left behind this list. And we can continue and continue and continue. And it's just, it's impossible uh, even to some kind of to mention everything. I would uh, mention probably uh, two, three points. Uh, first, his statement uh, when he some kind of uh, left the board of the plane uh, in Tbilisi when he arrived, I believe, June 1st, year 2004. Uh, that phrase became really very well known, not only in Georgia, but in Russia and maybe in many other areas. Uh, Kaha said, just really, some, I don't know, whether it's on the field or in the airport, he said, we shall sell everything except our conscious. And probably it's a little exaggeration, but uh, it was a discussion at that time that, okay, there is no such an object, there is no such a property in Georgia that cannot be sold. And probably with some exception for National Orthodox Cathedral in Tsheta. That considered to be some kind of really national pride. Okay, but all others, including some kind of offices, prime minister, presidential, some kind of, all uh, the infrastructure, everything can be sold. So, and you can uh, probably imagine what kind of shock such statements and such, uh, uh, such uh, desire, such uh, actions can produce in Georgia that did not have anything like that for previous years. Another uh, issue that uh, Kaha has also mentioned, uh, this reform of police. It's incredible, but Georgian police does not take bribes. For people who grew up in the former Soviet Union and who know what is the situation in Russia, in Georgia, and many other countries, it's just unthinkable. It's impossible to imagine that it could happen, but it's fact of life. And I've been to Georgia, I've seen it, just what, how the situation has changed. It's just really, it's impossible to imagine. And another issue, once again, it's just really striking. This electricity reform that uh, actually attracted only some kind of a couple of lines here in the presentation. Georgia for all history was an electricity deficient region. I know from the maybe uh, introduction of electricity, uh, Georgia was importing electricity from Russia. And so during the former Soviet Union, it was one story, but since uh, gaining independence, it became the very serious issue in uh, not only international relations, because sometimes uh, our Russian colleagues did use this preference for their favors. Uh, there was a lot of cuts in uh, electricity lines. There was a lot of problems and a lot of blackouts, not only because of some problems on uh, Georgian side, that also happened, but also on the problems on the Russian side. With an incredible short period of time, less than four years, Georgia has been uh, moved from electricity deficient country into countries that exporting electricity. Just you cannot imagine that country does not have oil, does not have gas, that really have a lot, uh, very, very small resources of any kind that can be used for producing electricity, studied to exp export electricity to Russia. And it shows 
what kind of results can be achieved with uh, two types of reforms. One type of reform that have been introduced uh, by Rao, yes, management in Russia, that countries st stop to export electricity to uh, Georgia, to Kazakhstan, to many other countries that is uh, used to export for decades. And what can be achieved by some other type of uh, economic reform? So, looking what have been achieved, uh, it's uh, hard, uh, yes. And in doing this, uh, Georgia became a really literal leader in transformation, leader in uh, reforms, both economic and many institutional, and many structural reforms. And in doing that, uh, so Georgia probably is not the, the really the top leader yet uh, in terms of some kind of state of uh, liberal um, uh, uh, environment and liberal um, uh, some kind of uh, framework, but ne but it's no doubt uh, Georgia became leader in the speed of bringing this uh, liberal transformation within a very short period of time, and in doing this, uh, Georgia has met very interesting challenges, not only on the domestic front, with some political opposition, with some kind of slow process of adaptation of people to new situation, but also with external challenges. One of these external challenges ca came from our respectable uh, international institution, IMF, uh, but that is really has a lot of good people and very important in producing technical support and many other reforms. But in some other reforms, looks like in some other policies, a position of um, our uh, colleagues from the IMF happen to be really lagging behind from what has been achieved by best countries, by best reformers, best people in some other countries. Uh, just let's take this example of um, uh, new uh, law that allows uh, to some kind of to fire the central bank chief uh, if uh, inflation exceeds threshold. IMF in just two, month, uh, two months ago has issued a statement, uh, just let me just quote it. Uh, the IMF stressed the importance of avoiding any erosion of central bank independence. In this regard, the mission believes believes that requirements for frequent parliamentary approval of monetary policy goals and instruments combined with new provisions for the automatic dismissal of the president of the National Bank of Georgia for missing the inflation target would weaken the operations of the central bank. That's a very interesting statement because it raises the question, what actually is more important, central bank independence or low inflation? And it looks like not all the time, these two targets can be combined. And sometimes central bank independence for uh, some of our colleagues from the fund uh, looks like more important than low inflation. And another issue, to be independent from whom and from what? From authorities or from the outcomes of these particular institutions? And it seems to me that Georgian authorities are moving in the right direction, putting inflation uh, and the dependence on outcomes of particular institutions at much higher level of importance than any other um, issues. So there is a, such a statement that uh, the war is too serious to leave it for the generals. Looking at the background of Kaha bin Lukiza, who is a biologist, as we know, and looking at the background of such a person like Mart Lahr, uh, twice prime minister, uh, former prime minister of Estonia, who is by training is historian, not economist, and Kaha is not economist, I start to think, okay, maybe economic reforms is too serious, are too serious to be left for economists by training. <laughs> at least looking at some experience that have been achieved by some other colleagues who have uh, actually not uh, accepted some kind of wrong knowledge or wrong approaches uh, given in some wrong institutions, uh, educational institutions. We can see that it's much more important the uh, most important element, the uh, desire to bring liberty and freedom and markets to uh, their respective countries. And now uh, uh, we can say that the really uh, 
And these results are especially important due to another external challenge, uh, external challenge that's coming from my own country, Russia, that in uh, October and November yet 2006 have introduced not only embargo as a politically correct statement from uh, our colleagues from the farm, but the total blockade trade blockade, economic blockade, transportation blockade, uh, some kind of visa blockade, uh, just even postal blockade, in a clear some kind of break with uh, the rules of the World Postal Union of the mid 19th centuries. So Georgia is, as we know, is a relatively uh, not so rich country like Russia in terms of GDP per capita, in terms of total GDP. It's much smaller country. It's 4 million people versus 142 million people in Russia. And 70% of um, uh, Georgian uh, foreign trade uh, was going to Russia and an input also uh, was coming from Russia. What was the result of this total economic and trade and transportation blockade on Georgia? Now we have results of year 2007, the first year of this uh, total blockade. Russian GDP grow, grew 8%. G uh, Georgian GDP grew 12.4%. Russia's uh, foreign direct investment into Russia uh, slightly exceeded 1% of GDP, but without uh, uh, FDI to oil and gas, it's much less. It's mu about 0.7% of GDP. In Georgia, that does not have neither oil, nor gas, nor huge natural resources. It is more than 12% of GDP. And those numbers show what can be achieved with policies of freedom, with policies of liberty, with right policies, with right institutions, and with right people who introduce those policies. That is much more important than national resources, than the violence, and than aggression. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andre. We have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and identify yourself and your affiliation, and wait for the microphone to reach you, please. We have a question in the back. Ashley March from Cato. Kaha, I was wondering in your country oh, about I the media. Could you turn up the sound or speak closer to the microphone, please? I was wondering in your country about the media. Are they economically literate? And how is the press reporting on all of these reforms? Uh, uh, I think that 90, uh, if we are uh, talking about printed, uh, and not only printed, but in printed media, I think that there is, uh, they are 100% uh, against reforms. The, our, uh, our press, our, our newspapers, our magazines, they are 100% uh, uh, supportive uh, not to make uh, these reforms, and they are against government. In uh, electronic media, the situation is a little bit different, but mainly I can say that the main uh, uh, point, uh, modus operandi of our journalists, not all of them, uh, of course, but most of them, is uh, to be very critical. I think it uh, maybe is not, there is nothing, nothing, nothing very special because uh, uh, you cannot make make good uh, good newspaper supporting government and talking that life is very good and there is no scandals. So I think it's normal and uh, I, I, am, I, I, am, I, I am one of the most hated person in uh, power printed media, for example. Any other questions? So let's take a question right here. And yes. I'm Helen Raffel, Resources for the Future, and I'm wondering what measures are taken to protect your natural resources from rapid depletion and also to protect the environment in general? Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, the, uh, uh, there is different types of natural resources. If you're talking about mineral resources like uh, some deposits, they should be depleted because that's the nature of them. Because they I'm having some, for example, we have not very, quite small uh, copper mine. So I mean, 
preserve a copper mine, not to deplete it from copper is, I, mean, I think, useless. The, uh, it was created by God to be depleted for human beings. Um, and uh, uh, if we are talking about uh, nature as, uh, as it is, I think that there is several things. Uh, uh, I mean, there is no one receipt uh, for, the, for one answer for all of this. First of all, of course, we have uh, uh, reserved territories, and they are quite significant part of Georgia, and you cannot have any type of activity there. And uh, long term, I think that, that uh, the recreation capacity of Georgia can be much more than any other types of uh, 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 economic outcomes from uh, using natural resources. Sorry? Trees. Yeah, trees. Trees. I think that the uh, there is. Uh, I think that the one of the best way to preserve forests is to have them in private ownership. Uh, private ownership, and if there is a will of nation, the regulation of uh, logging. Uh, there is uh, an institution which is based in uh, uh, in New York. Uh, which is called the Tropical Forest Something um, Research Institute, which is um, affiliated with the United Nations. It's very pro, uh, pro let's say, uh, pro protective. And they make a research about tropical forests. And the, uh, in countries where tropical forests can be privately owned and commercially uh, used, uh, the uh, level of uh, uh, conservation is much higher than in countries that when uh, there is no formally no no commercial use of tropical forests, or, uh, or there is uh, heavy regulation, no private ownership on that. I think that that's 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 only one evidence for, for our tropical forests about our country. I think that we have we have different uh, regions of Georgia, and in, in Western Georgia, mainly there is historical. Uh, legacy of uh, which forest belongs to whom. It's not formal, because I mean, formally they are owned by government. And I can say that if you go uh, either in the most difficult uh, time when uh, there was no electricity, for example, people were uh, taking care about their forest. And they all know the uh, where is the uh, margin of this forest, despite that there is no formal documents about that. And they were not allowing other people to cut trees to uh, in their their forest so i think that that's one of the things which uh, which is important that cannot be the only thing because i think that uh, the i'm uh, unfortunate to say but the best way to preserve preserve uh, nature is not to have human beings at all um, uh, that's um, i think not achievable uh, and not uh, not what, what what don't we are working for so i think that that's a, that's a trade off uh, always a trade-off, but I think in that, that area there is a lot of myths and uh, what is good, what is bad. And I, I think that uh, my country is very beautiful, and uh, I, I want to repeat that I think that the beauty of Georgia can, uh, ten, can generate uh, in future more, more uh, economic wealth than, I mean, just uh, logging or, I don't know, uh, drilling or whatever. But it does not mean that we should do that on some, by some uneconomic means. By, keeping everything in state property and thinking that that's good. Uh, we'll take a question right here. Maybe I'll stay there. You want to stay? It's much more comfortable. Thank you. Ana Lucia Coronel, Mission Chief for uh, Can you Georgia? speak louder, please? Yes. Maybe something is with the microphone. I don't know. OK. Do you hear me? Okay. Strong. Yeah, this is Ana Lucia Coronel, the mission chief for Georgia from the IMF. Um, I just have um, a comment and a question. Uh, my comment uh, relates to inflation and the central bank. Uh, what does the IMF believe about that? Uh, the IMF believes that inflation should be the main objective of the central bank. And in that regard, we welcome very much in our conversations with the authorities during the mission, that the central bank law was reformed to state that price stability is the main uh, objective of the central bank. Uh, regarding independence of the central bank, uh, the central bank needs independence to get this main objective. And in that regard, uh, what uh, we believe is that the central bank doesn't need to have any interference from parliament or other political stances. And that's also what 
we discussed during the mission, and we welcomed a lot that the automatic dismissal of the Central One Bank uh, president was dropped from the draft legislation, uh, which was very important. And we welcomed very much that the legislation that was approved uh, uh, it takes into account a, a vote from parliament, but not an automatic dismissal. So just for clarification. Um, and then my question is related to inflation. How do you see the inflation outlook in the next months, uh, given what is happening in the global economy regarding food and fuel prices? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I may, may, may make a short comment on your comment that uh, I'm not very glad that we have no auto automatic dismissal of Central Bank uh, head, because I think that Central Bank has all instruments to keep inflation low. Uh, and uh, uh, about the, uh, about the next, I think that what is happening with food prices is uh, pushing inflation pressure, but inflation is manageable because it's monetary function. I heavily believe that uh, inflation is monetary a result of monetary activity, and so I cannot understand how food price uh, inflation can uh, can influence CPI in general. I really cannot understand that if CPI is really balanced, based on balanced basket of goods. How it can happen, I cannot understand. Uh, and uh, uh, we have, uh, we are, uh, we, we, I, and uh, either this uh, uh, automatic dismissal is not effective, uh, the responsibility of central bank presidents is very high in any case, because the parliament can vote for confidence. And uh, we have a uh, very heavy uh, fight against inflation in any case, because we have, unfortunately, the remnants of budgetary de budget deficit uh, from uh, last year, 2007, and uh, Central Bank is using, uh, they are rising interest rates and they are, uh, they are depreciating currency. That maybe is not the best thing which can happen, because they are just responding on the, uh, on the, on the challenges, but uh, I think that this year we'll have less inflation than we have last year. Just, I, I don't want to start uh, this very interesting uh, and uh, some kind of promising discussion about the role of independence of the central bank in uh, fighting inflation, but let me just mention that in year 1992, the Russian central bank was the mostly independent from any uh, source of power, both executive and representative. And that year, inflation in Russia was 2,600 percent per year. So that is why uh, it means that the, just the general notion that the central bank independence is the key and the only key to low inflation certainly is uh, not completely correct. And there are uh, different ways how to deal with the main target, how to put inflation down. And I think um, the Georgian experience uh, is including along with Russian experience of some kind of, of negative side and the positive side, could uh, produce interesting data and interesting material to think more about what is the best way how to put inflation down. Because it seems to me we united, uh, I mean, the IMF, Georgian authorities, we, and we are uh, modest analysts here, that uh, putting inflation down is the most important target. Uh, and I, uh, it's, it's really exciting. Uh, the topic, so I, I also want to say that I think that uh, formally, formally, putting in the look into papers, Zimbabwean Central Bank is much more independent than it was the Bank of England before reform, I mean, in the uh, end of 20th century. Yeah, because the Bank of England was part of uh, Treasury Department, and the uh, Zimbabwean Central Bank, I think it's well structured, uh, um, uh, having very good uh, uh, statute. Uh, by law and uh, regulation institute. Uh, but uh, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's uh, not the, I mean, these things are important, of course, but the most important thing is uh, what, the, what, uh, what the nation uh, wants, if it is democratic, and the, uh, what's, the, what's the institutions, how institutions are structured and balanced. Uh, I, I think that the Federal Reserve was also independent before Walker and after Walker, but there is, was a huge difference in, uh, I think there was no change in any law of uh, Federal Reserve. Right. Yeah, but uh, there was big difference in monetary policy before Paul Walker and after Paul Walker. 
the question in front here. Right here. Hi, uh, Warren Coates, IMF retired, uh, currently senior monetary policy advisor to the central banks of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, a quick comment, if you'll permit me, on independence, and then a, a, a question. The the central bank that introduced the the idea of a governor uh, resigning if he didn't fulfill the inflation objective was New Zealand. And, and the way they did it was not a mandatory resi resignation, but a mandatory offering of the resignation that the government could then evaluate, given the circumstances, whether they wish to accept it or not, which is an in interesting mm -hmm. variant. The, the independence, as Andre said, is no guarantee, but it may be a huge help. And the high inflation in Russia in 92 was far more for technical reasons of Russia not having control over a payment system that extended throughout all of the former republics, whereby it was issuing huge amounts of credit while all the other republics in 92 were still using the Russian currency. Um, my question then is, given that reforms for all of the medium long term, I mean the kinds of reforms you've been enacting, for all the medium long-term benefits of liberty and prosperity that flow from them, nonetheless are often quite painful processes and can create a great deal of anxiety on the part of the population. Throughout Central and Eastern Europe, virtually every government, uh, and most, most of them, most of the time, were pretty reformist, was voted out and replaced by the opposition, who in turn were voted out and, and replaced by, by the first, perhaps reflecting this, um, this difficulty for people uh, accepting rapid reform. What is your prognosis for Georgia in the coming election, uh, and what advice would you give for minimizing this uh, reform backlash? Oh, I mean... Uh, my uh, uh, my uh, my my prognosis for uh, upcoming parliamentary elections is based on uh, deep uh, uh, poll re polling research, which was done at the beginning of May. So it's I mean, it's there's next. I I am not adding value to that. I mean that there would be significant majority will go to ruling party. So it's very very simple thing. Uh, uh, so it's, there is not, no 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 rocket science there. Just a result of polling, and uh, but I think that yeah, there is a problem. Uh, but problem is coming not from these reforms. Actually, uh, I can uh, swear that no, none of this reform was uh, uh, really sensitive for a population. For example, uh, except maybe people who were fired from police, or for example, I downsized the whole system of Ministry of Economic Development three times, and of course those people are not very happy. I think. Uh, um, I, I, I helped downsizing the Ministry of Agriculture five times, and also those people are not very happy. But uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, quite a small part of the population. Uh, that's why, for example, if you look to voting results, and I think the same would be in parliamentary elections, the capital city voters, they vote for opposition. Uh, people outside capital city, they vote for ruling party because they get some benefits from reforms. And uh, of course, all this corruption, all this excessive uh, government employees, all this police, they were mainly concentrated in capital city. And of course, we get that result. But there is, um, but really, there is a problem. Problem is that the uh, modern growth based on foreign direct investments, based on deregulation, etc., it's mainly jobless growth. So it means that you are accumulating some types of expectations in, uh, in public, and then those expectations are not happening. So, for example, people feel that there is economic growth, people feel there is better road, people feel there is new hotels, new, uh, new uh, processing uh, facilities, new investments, new equipment, but they are out of this. Yeah? For example, let's take agriculture. Our agriculture is one of the most inefficient part of our, in, our, our, our economy. Uh, um, 50% of population producing 12% of GDP. And of course, any 
any uh, improvements in agriculture, like new technologies, like uh, uh, more, more uh, capital-intensive things which uh, reduce uh, need in workforce, they will not benefit any, uh, anyone in, in, in rural area a lot. Yeah? That means that we should have uh, another system, and that's question about, not about uh, economic reforms that was the ideal structure of economy, but about political economy of uh, reforms. And political ef economy of reforms, so you need to soften uh, not uh, outcome of reform, but soften uh, this uh, uh, absence of outcome for part of the population. And uh, that's uh, why, for example, we, are, uh, we have quite a big uh, portfolio of uh, social programs, and I think that the, uh, the efficiency of those programs should be increased. Uh, we are spending 34% of our uh, budget for different uh, types of benefits, and the, uh, the improving quality of this, those transfers means uh, quite a lot, because it means that uh, the uh, most uh, needed population would be protected. Of course, it's not the very good thing from, uh, uh, from the point of their motivation and uh, uh, how they uh, look to new, uh, new jobs and how they invent something by themselves, etc. But that's an avoidable thing because uh, two million Georgians, so half of the population, living in rural area, how they, they cannot disappear. So it, it, they cannot find found jobs right tomorrow. So it means that you, you, you must, must have some uh, transition period, like 20 years, uh, to uh, really change things there and uh, having having completely new type of economy outside big cities. Yeah, of course that's the that's the biggest issue. That's issue not related to what is good in general, but what is good right now. But I want to emphasize emphasize the one very important thing. If you go to uh, reform uh, Swiss or uh, American or uh, British healthcare, there can be a lot of discussion because it's working and you want it to work better. If you want to improve Polizia Stradale in uh, the road policy in Italy, I think it can work much better. And but it's working. If you if you want to change, for example, road police or the GBDD in Russia, you can do it without hesitation because it's not working. Changing, or if you want to improve healthcare system in Georgia, also welcome because we can discuss what's the best way to reform it. But oh, let's be cautious not to do something bad. How we can do bad there where there is nothing? Impossible, yeah? If you have a non-working computer, it's not a computer, yeah? Non-working police is not a police. <laughs> Removing those police, you cannot do anything bad. So reforms in, so it's very difficult to, uh, in this audience with those excellent people to understand what means, for example, I don't know, uh, road police in Turkmenistan. Or, I mean, a uh, custom system in Uzbekistan, yeah? Because you think that that's like uh, border, uh, border c control uh, guys from Homeland Security in the United States, but, but they, they're just Uzbeks or Georgians or, or Tajiks. No, it's not the same, and, and ethnicity or nationality are changing. It's another thing. It's not the same type of institution. It's completely another type of institution. And the, the uh, art of making, uh, making reforms in countries like Georgia and other countries which I mentioned, is just to understanding where you have functional institution, and there are very few, like Central Bank, and we were very careful about reforming Central Bank because it's more or less functional, and where you have this functional institution, like uh, uh, admin admittance system to uh, universities, which was completely dysfunctional. Yeah? So that's, that's, the, that's the answer for any types of reform on that type of countries. Uh, just a brief comment, uh, just for sake of clarity. Um, in 1992, uh, Russia did have a budget deficit of 30% of GDP, one of probably the largest in the peaceful time of any uh, country after the Second World War. Out of the 30% of GDP, only 8% of GDP were the so-called technical credits to the countries of CIS. Even those 8%, so it's, it's about one quarter 
of total budget deficit that has been financed by money creation. But even these 8% of GDP, uh, these technical credits, have been approved by the Russian government. So whatever number you would ha have, either 30% of GDP or 22% of GDP net budget deficit for domestic uh, economy, that would be huge money creation that has created this unbelievably high inflation with the so-called independent central bank. We have time for at least one more question and answer right here in the front. I, I don't know why we want Central Bank, but that's another question. Thank you, Morris McTeague at the Makeda Centre at George Mason University. Uh, I was a member of the New Zealand Cabinet the very first time that the Governor missed uh, his inflation target, and uh, the Government decided that it would do nothing about it. And I think the debate that we've having, we're having here is that the results, the achievement of the central bank, are the critical factor. That's the most important measure. The independence is about the day-to-day -day management of how you keep inflation low, and there should be total independence about that. Uh, but what I really wanted to ask you about was something that you briefly referred to, and I applaud all of what you're doing. You did in four years, which took, took us more than 10 years, and I think you've done it better. Uh, you mentioned currency reform, and I would be interested about that because inflation and currency are issues for small countries that are very, very difficult uh, to manage. Uh, New Zealand tried many um, mechanisms for managing the currency uh, until 1985. In 1985, we freely floated the currency, and the government has never, ever spent a dollar on it since, uh, and it's been the most effective mechanism for managing the currency. But I'm interested in, in how you see uh, Georgia going forward on that issue. Thank you. First of all, I want to say that I am a big fan of New Zealand. I've never been there, but I have chance to meet uh, Sir Roger Douglas, uh, Graham Scott, and uh, uh, Ruth Richardson. And Ruth Richardson was in Georgia, and uh, uh, she was. Uh, it was in 2005, but uh, uh, this central bank reform is partially inspired by uh, by her. Let's say. Good. So she is a great guy, uh, lady. I, I want to say guy, but <laughs> but, but she is a great guy also. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I think that uh, the, the small countries they don't need central bank, yeah. frankly, uh, because it's uh, absolutely a natural, a natural uh, uh, thing. Uh, you are spending huge amount of uh, political will, a huge amount of, huge amount of. Uh, efforts, a uh, big part of GDP, to maintain something like central bank. And the mistakes of central bank cost terrible amount of money, for a terrible amount of growth for any country. Uh, what's, the, uh, what's the way to uh, avoid central, having central bank? Uh, the easiest way, which is uh, educated by uh, our friend, uh, uh, is uh, to have a currency board, like it happens in uh, uh, some countries like, for example, uh, Estonia. Uh, the uh, other way, which I think is much more efficient, despite the seniorage which you are uh, losing, is not to have a currency at all, like it, it, was, it is done in Montenegro. Yeah, because for what for what you need currency? It's a question of pride. Now we can say, no, it's not a question of pride, because uh, Finns have no currency. They are using euro, or French are using euro. And I think that, I mean, they are not thinking that that's French currency. That's something, yeah? So we, it's 21st century. We are, I hope, too sophisticated not to think that it's, you need uh, your national anthem uh, or your national stamp on a piece of paper which you're using to buy bread or butter.